are listening to WHOA Podcast, coming to you from Gainesville, Florida. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WHOA GNV Podcast, the podcast for you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. I am your host, Colin Austin, and my co-host is like a cork in a bottle of champagne, keeping it all together until he finally pops. Probably soon. Michael Dees, <laughs> what is up, my man? Dude, it's a sprint to the end of the year. We're, we're actually, no, we're <laughs> December 30th. Days. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's the, the sprint into 2020 is what we've got here. There so. you go, man. Yeah. Well, uh, New Year's resolutions, you got any yet? I'm, a, I'm not a resolution fan. I'm like, a like if you decide you want to do something, start today, don't wait till the year. Like, I don't know. Uh, I've always kind of been bugged, bug, but but if, okay. if your resolutions are your thing, uh, best of luck uh, sticking to them. But... All right. Do you have any resolutions? No, not at all. Yeah. Okay. So I, <laughs> I mean, so I definitely want to. I want to try to get back on the workout train a little bit to keep up with you. <laughs> right. I'm I putting mean, the pressure on. I know. Now you're you're putting the pressure on waking up at four o'clock. And what time are you waking up? I wake up at four thirty. Four thirty. I hit the gym at six. Yeah. So I don't know what inspired Michael to get into like this workout mode, but you definitely. When, when did you I, turn that on? I had to keep up the energy. I know, but when? When did that happen? Uh, it was July of this year. July. Uh, yeah. So it's all been. Right. Got to keep up the energy. Yeah. So right. see, that's Gotta what I'm saying. Up, I started my resolution like in July. I don't wait till January. It's, yeah. Do you have more energy than I do? No. Okay. Yeah. Just not sure. yet. <laughs> as, a, as a kid, my mom used to always say, "Oh, I need like transfusions from Michael because like he always is hyper." And I wish I still had that. Okay. I don't know. Do you have any New Year's uh, like traditions or anything? Or? Black eyed peas and collard greens. Yeah. Yeah. Have okay. to. Like, That's are you gonna be at thing. home or are you gonna be doing? Gonna no, be doing I'll be New here. Year's Eve. I'll be here. Um, I don't. I'll probably make plans. See, I was actually really excited to do like the whole like we're, we're in the twenties again and do like some uh, Gatsby style party. Like I just I, you blink and it's here and I haven't planned it yet, so I, I don't know. I might have to find one to go to. Uh, but no, I mean I'll, I'll probably look something up over the holidays and okay, you know there you go yeah. So tell people about this event that's going on for this nonprofit. So speaking of, like, we got non- yeah. nonprofit of the day, New Year's resolutions, and yep. uh, you know you get all those holiday calories. You got to burn them off somehow. <laughs> so we have on January 11th, the tour to Falasco is presented by the Friends of San Falasco Inc., which is a nonprofit volunteer uh, CSO. That's a citizen support organization <laughs> dedicated to supporting the trail system and other efforts within the park. Uh, it's a mountain bicycling event in the fund is the main fundraiser. It's an endurance test, not a race. Uh, and as I said, it's January 11th. 2020 with a rolling start time between 7.30 a.m. and 8.30 a.m. Please go out and support the citizen support organization, uh, the Tour de Falasco. Dude, Tracy's choking on her beard. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> I hear the giggles She's in the like, background and I'm like, I just gotta get through it. This is like, this is like what's so great is like, we haven't even introduced the guest yet. She's like over there choking on her uh, first magnitude Ursa. Uh, you guys, we're recording. It's uh, right now. I mean, just, I mean, everybody knows that we record these in advance. The recording Record date is November 22nd. It's a Friday night. We're all feeling really good right now. So I'm like, I'm thinking this episode is going to be epic. And um, well, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce yeah, our guest. <laughs> let's get into it. Uh, today on the show, we have Dr. Tracy Fanara, also known as Inspector Planet, a host, engineer, writer, scientist, and UF alum. Welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Inspector Planet. Oh, she knew he was going to. <laughs> everybody does that. Yeah, Come on. Everybody should, do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. Everybody I mean, over 30 does it, that. <laughs> you, can't, you can't ignore the Inspector Gadget part of that, though. Right. Oh, you know, Inspector gotta, Gadget. Yeah, it's uh, sustainability Gadget, Planet, and it's like sustainability. I, I mean, Sustainability and innovation together. Yeah, you can't have true sustainability without innovation entropy. <laughs> well, so. are you okay over there? I mean, yeah. well, I you know this is my first beer in like years. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. So are you like just having well, one because we're having one? Or no, you don't have to. We don't force All I anybody do is work. here. If I was in here, I'd be home writing a proposal right now. Okay. I know it's so pathetic. <laughs> I really hey. Well, hey, so let's just let's get into it because uh, we haven't met until tonight, and I'm super pumped that um, that Ty. I mean Ty, my previous co-host before Michael came on, right. 
Ty, I miss you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I still, I love you though, Michael. It's all right. Shout out to Ty. OG. But shout out to Ty, OG, um, for, for connecting us. Super awesome. Um, and so thank you for making the time to come into our studio and hanging out with us tonight. I'm super excited to get into your story, but we haven't met until tonight. True. And uh, we have this natural click. We're BFFs forever. I mean, that's what happens when people come onto the show. <laughs> <laughs> he just speaks it into existence. Uh, it forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, actually, I need to make sure that I actually kind of shut up this episode. Yeah, I, you were you were doing I, some uh, episode watches. Yeah, before this, I mean, right? I want to apologize to <laughs> you. Don't have to to our guests and to Michael. I was kind of like reviewing a couple of like episodes in the last <laughs> month or so, and I'm like, dang, I talk too much, and I just need to let Mike talk, and I need to let the guests talk, and I just need to stay quiet. So I'm just gonna apologize to our audience if I get into mood sometimes and I just start talking a lot but anyway so I do the same thing at like group meetings I have to tell myself not to talk so I start looking at my phone just because I will talk like it's this don't worry I'll compete with you okay well well, let's do it starting now so what we like to do is we like to start with a story okay so just tell us your story. Like, I mean, I know that you went to the University of Florida. Like, what got you there? Why did you decide to study what you studied? And what got you to where you are today? You know, everybody thinks about those pinnacle moments back in their life where they kind of made decisions that kind of directed the path that they would go on. And for me, when I think back, I think about my fourth grade teacher telling me about Love Canal. It was a hazardous waste dump site that industries were dumping toxins into this canal way. And the toxins were leaching into the soil and the groundwater and they were moving and people were building houses and schools and there were cancer clusters and birth defects. And that's when I realized that everything was connected. What we put into the environment eventually comes back to affect our health. And my friend's mom had MS in her 20s. My mom had cancer in her 20s. Who knows if it's directly related, but but I really had a passion for the environment at a young age. And I started winning all of these invention conventions. It was what it was called before science fair. <laughs> and, uh, and just the science and engineering, it all kind of came together when I got rejected from the University of Florida. So I went to school to uh, play lacrosse in upstate New York. My parents only let me go an hour and a half away from home. And then they moved to Florida. So <laughs> my dad would leave voicemails every day for my uh, roommates to hear about how how beautiful it was. It was 80 degrees and sunny. Meanwhile, I'm trucking an uphill both ways through the snow <laughs> to lacrosse practice. No joke. I mean, it was a hill. So, of course, it's uphill both ways. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, so I was miserable. I applied to the University of Florida. That summer, I was a camp counselor in Maine, and my mom called me, oh, by the way, you didn't get into Florida. I was like, what? And I knew it wasn't it wasn't because of my grades. It was because I hadn't taken physics yet, and I was transferring into mm. the College of Liberal Arts. That was a Mom biology. opened your mail? Ah, uh, yeah, she did. <laughs> And she still does. Like, it's, well, it's supposed to be like a big reveal, right? Like the yes, okay. no, and there mom's was just laying it on you. Zero <laughs> privacy. She went under my, my mattress once and found my diary. What is second base? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> digress <laughs> so oh. I went over to the University of Florida I brought my transcripts and I knocked on every door until somebody answered and it happened to be the Dean of Environmental Engineering and he told me about how environmental engineers are the ones that make sure everybody has clean water and enough food and protects people from natural disasters and they were able to build and design and I was like sign me up I want to be a superhero And like everything kind of came full circle. And I absolutely fell in love with environmental engineering. I mean, it is very broad, um, but I found my my place in water. So graduating from undergrad, I wanted to be a, I wanted to genetically engineer microbes to clean up wastewater. And, uh, but I took the first job anyway, it was in land development, a little bit of a stretch. And I realized how we were mismanaging our land in the state of Florida. I mean, really badly. Like, I saw that cyanobacteria train coming from a mile away. I mean, we are manipulating the water cycle. What used to happen is that it would rain, water percolates through the ground, it would be treated by biology, chemistry, and and physics. And now, instead of recharging that groundwater table, 
that water is running off at really high velocities, really low water quality, causing erosion, uh, flooding, bacteria, cyanobacteria blooms, um, and a number of other implications to wildlife. So I went back to school to prove that there was a better way. You know, I had tried to work with my clients, the land developers, you know, they're, yeah, try low impact development, sustainable development. It's going to save you money. And they're like, nah, we know how much this is going to cost and, and how long it's going to take. I'm like, I can, but it's cheaper. And they just weren't having it. So I went and I came back to UF and, uh, and it was hard starting grad school at 26. I felt so old. And uh, what I realized is you're always going to feel old because right now you're the oldest you've ever been. It's new territory, no matter what. And I'm so glad that I decided to get over that and go back to school because I truly found my passion. Dude, it's, and it's so hard in Gainesville <laughs> for us. I mean, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm like, yeah, so I'm like 37 now and I feel like I'm 21 still. But the one thing that always holds true is that you get a year older and another class of 18 year olds comes in. Yeah. <laughs> they always that, stay the same age. <laughs> they always stay the same age. You get older, they always stay the same age. So that always happens. So what years were you at UF for your undergrad? Uh, 2001 to 2003. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you and I, we were here at the same time. Yeah. Because I was yeah. 2000 to 2004. Uh-huh. And then I okay. came back uh, for grad school in 2008. Okay. Uh, All right. So I got, a, I got a question for you. Yeah. I mean, how much did scooter culture shift in the, that time period? Do you remember oh, at all? Oh, so much. It's so <laughs> funny because right when I walked in here and I saw all the scooters, I just thought about my huge crush on Jesse Palmer and Brock, whatever his last name <laughs> Berlin. was. Thank you, yep, Brock Berlin. They were the, the, you know, the quarterbacks and they had the scooters. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't this campus wide thing back then. And now, you know, that y you see the scooters all over the place. Yeah. You got in at the right time, man. That was brilliant. <laughs> well, it's funny because you said 2001 to 2003. So we started in 2004. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we got back, 2008, we were starting to really start cranking. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2008 is especially during the gas crunch, that kind of time. Yeah. We were selling a lot during People that looking time. For cheaper transportation. So 2008 is like really when it started to kind of get right. its launch. But ah, that's cool. So, yeah. I mean, so you said in when you were a child, you had like these engine conventions. Invention conventions, invention, yes. Invention conventions. Yeah, so I mean, that's like, like a, a science fair. Yeah. And you used to win them or? Yeah, all the time. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. never won <laughs> anything like that ever when I was in school. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, well, what definitely, was your major? Definitely no, I wasn't meant to be a scientist <laughs> by any means. Uh, business. So, okay. I mean, obviously. I well, obviously. Got into yeah. business, but right. like, uh, yeah, it was just general. Business administration was my major and I'm mass, I, I did my um, minor in mass communications. So got a lot of that advertising PR kind of background too when I was in school, but anyway. Cool. <laughs> Mine was in microbiology. So. Really? Yeah. I love microbiology. <laughs> I actually work in microbiology now. Aren't you? <laughs> I, it, I didn't expect it, but now I, uh, I'm a red tide expert, so that's Right, sucks. actually, as I was, first of all, like, as I was doing the research for this episode, I was like, I don't know, maybe five minutes in, and I'm like, she's a total badass. <laughs> like, it's just cool what you do, and the way you make this stuff, like, I always felt nerdy, but like, it's cool to like, chase that passion, especially in science, and like, be a badass about it, so well well done on you. But yeah, I, I was reading, I, I grew up in uh, a town called Merritt Island, Florida, on the East Coast, and and so whether it was like sea lice that kept you out of the water or red tie, like that, that was something that we always had to deal with. And I have a lot of friends that are on the Gulf Coast now. So, and, and we're in the middle of a, a bloom right now. Is that, we is are, that correct? We are, you're right? correct. So it, it's definitely relevant. Um, so how did you, how did you single in? You said that's like what your, what your main focus is right now? Yeah, it's funny because I never thought that I would be doing this. Like, you know, you go through school and biology is like easy. You know, you just have to memorize things. <laughs> Get into engineering, it's that's all application. That's why I failed. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've never failed anything. Well, I'm that's the thing. Like, if you don't put the time into it, you know. But but with biology, I'm like, ah, it's easy. I didn't really have a respect for biologists until I got to moat. So I took the job because going through school, I saw my friends like throwing trash out their car window, and I would ask them where they thought that that went, and 100% of them didn't know or thought that it went to a wastewater treatment plant. I was like, no, we do not have combined sewers here. 
every single drop of rain that lands in the state of Florida goes to a natural water body. And I started seeing their behaviors change. Because their behaviors change, I was like, there's something to this whole education communication thing that that's got to be part of what I do. So this job was, you know, it's a nonprofit independent. Uh, it offered me like a third of what everybody else was offering me and it was three hours away. Mm. But I took it because after meeting the scientists, I knew that everybody there wanted, really wanted to change the world. And they were, they had the freedom to do that. Um, so that's why I took the job is communication and research. I wasn't too happy about this whole microbiology thing. It's a, you know, I was big picture watershed scale. And now I'm supposed to be working on, you know, a microscopic phytoplankton. Like that, that was ridiculous to me, but I, I was like- I don't even know what a phytoplankton is. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, and so like, it, uh, yeah, so I thought that I was just gonna solve this problem and move on. But yeah, so phytoplankton, they're photosynthetic plant-like organisms. Okay. So they are responsible over millennia for all of the oxygen, well, most of the oxygen, sorry, in our atmosphere. You know, trees do help. Um, but but cyan the evolution of cyanobacteria changed the atmosphere as we know it. Um, and it has provided us what we have today to survive. Um, so phytoplankton is extremely important. However, very few species are toxic or harmful. And what that means is they release a, a toxin that can harm aquatic life. And what makes Florida red tide so unique is that this species, Karenia brevis, the toxin released is called brevitoxin. It can actually aerosolize, attach onto sea salt particles in the air and move on shore with winds causing mm. respiratory, like mm. coughing, sneezing in people that are healthy. But for those with asthma or COPD, this can be super serious. Mm. Um, and last year, you know, every decade or so, we have really intense long bloom. And last year, 16 month bloom got really intense in July, 2018. And uh, I mean, this toxin was seeping through fil air filters. Like it, we, it was, it was hard to breathe. Well, what's the mode. definition of a bloom? A uh, concentration of more than ten thousand cells per liter. And the crazy thing is, even at a hundred thousand cells per liter, a million cells per liter, these things are so small that you can, in a vial, it looks completely clear. It's crazy. Hmm. And. And it's fed by, uh, I mean, what, what causes it? I mean, it's, it's nutrient overload. That's a great question. So most algae blooms like cyanobacteria uh, are directly correlated with these nutrient loads. Florida tide is different. So they're really slow growing. They're outcompeted near shore by other organisms. So they actually like to hang back and it's hypothesized that there's a cyst phase, but they like to hang back like 10 to 40 miles offshore at the ocean bottom near this ridge. And then when currents upwelling come through, basically it takes those cells and brings them up. Now there's a few different hypotheses. One is really interesting. Um, it's thought that initiation of these blooms could be uh, due to uh, sands from the Sahara coming over and depositing in the Gulf of Mexico. Have you guys ever seen those maps? Yeah, so sands, Saharan sands come over and deposit in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, they play a role in hurricane formation, but also in Florida red tide bloom uh, initiation. So there is a marine cyanobacteria named called Trichodesmium. And this species is nitrogen fixing. So that means that it's able to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and it's limiting nutrient is iron. I know this is getting really into the weeds. I, mean, I, I love it, but <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah. actually, I told Mike before <laughs> earlier today. I'm like, this is going to be one of those episodes that I just kind of step out of. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So, so for these trichodesmium, iron is their nutrient is their limiting nutrient, meaning that they have everything else that they need, and iron is what causes them to grow really fast. So, iron comes over in the, these Saharan dust provides trichodesmium with that iron. They grow like crazy, then they die, providing nutrients to Karenia brevis on the bottom of the ocean. And then with a, when upwelling comes, loop, well, loop current brings it close to shore. Uh, that's, that's when we experience those effects from Florida red tide. Okay, and it seems like that's been more problematic this past yeah. year or two. I mean, yeah, I mean. Um, I mean, my parents have like a condominium down in Treasure Island and 
I just remember them saying, oh, you guys don't want to come down this weekend and get the red tide. And I mean, there's... They got lucky compared to other places. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll tell you no, that. I'm sure. Um, but yeah, we have a bloom every year in the Gulf of Mexico somewhere. Um, okay. and, but the thing is, when these blooms get close enough to shore, they can use, they're not picky eaters. They can eat like 13 different forms of nutrients. One of them being the surface water nutrient from uh, urbanization, like I was explaining before, or uh, wastewater overflows, septic, anything like that. They can use that. Um, however, they, can, they don't need that. Uh, so the question is, how much influence do we have on these blooms when they're close enough to shore? We know uh, at the peak of the bloom last year, their primary source of uh, nutrients was actually the decomposing fish. So that's why moving forward, one of the plans is to remove those fish from the, from the water to not provide those nutrients. But, um, but yeah, so last year we had a 16 month balloon It started in November, 2017, and it went until I think February, 2019. And then, uh, before that we had a 18 month bloom, 2004, five and six. And back in the nineties, we had a 30 month bloom. So every decade or so we get these really long, intense blooms, hmm. you know, some people associate them with, well, I shouldn't say NASA and NOAA did a correlation of them between these really big hur hurricane hurricanes, events, right. but we've had hurricanes without red tide and we've had red tide without hurricanes, so, but these really long blooms seem to coincide. And with hurricane Irma, remember those pictures bringing all that water offshore? Mm -hmm and creating almost a forced upwelling event where those bottom water waters come to the top. Uh, it's hypothesized that that could be what started this really long bloom. And then it's also hypothesized that another bloom started in 2018 that met up with the 2017 bloom causing that really intense situation. At the same time that the bloom got really intense, uh, we had a lot of rainfall and a lot of, a lot of surface water runoff coming into the coast. So we know that, you know, we have nutrient loading coming from many different sources. And we also know that, you know, that surface water nutrients can play a role in Florida red tide. I'm like super fascinated. I could, I could literally <laughs> talk about this for, for like, so is there, is there like a, I mean, part of your, the stuff I've read is you, everything's connected, right? Yeah. Is there, is there a huge like human impact element to this? I mean, out, outside of getting like, okay, well, are, is human creating hurricanes you know like but is there like huge human impact that that like awareness would help like the right. issue or yeah so so basically what i tell people is you know red tide would be here whether we were here or not okay but the part that that we play that surface water runoff that can come into those coastal waters uh possibly prolonging or exacerbating an existing bloom that's where we come into play because of uh how i was explaining earlier how we've manipulated the water cycle mm -hmm. what we can do at our own homes is disconnect our it's called impervious surface anything that the water cannot penetrate like houses or concrete asphalt anything like that so basically right now rain falls on your roof goes into your gutter down your driveway and into a storm sewer that water automatically or directly goes into a water body now if you disconnect that impervious so the rain falls on your roof, goes down your gutter into a cistern that then time releases into a rain garden or infiltration trench or, or anything that would slow that water down and allow it to be naturally degraded by biological, chemical, and physical methods. You're, you're limiting your nutrient and hydrologic footprint right at your own home. That's one of the things you can do. Uh, responsible, uh, taking care of your lawn. If you use reclaim water for irrigation, you have enough nutrients. You do not need to fertilize. Um, things like that, like not adding additional nutrients. I mean, and that that goes full circle into the source of where we're getting that phosphorus. You know, like limiting the amount we need to mine in Florida is always a good thing. I was just a business major. <laughs> this is like way over Dude, my head. Everything's I'm connected, sorry. man. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, no, Florida I'm sorry. Red Tide is super connect is super super complicated. And <laughs> I'm just, I was just like, this is like way yeah. over my head. <laughs> uh, like my questions are like, if you could be any animal, which one would you be? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kind of <laughs> I have an answer to that. Man. I know. Well, I mean, I'm just like these are like like my questions. Yeah. Like, I'm kind of curious what Mike's questions are. Like, <laughs> like, this is deep stuff that's like way over my head. I just 
is I like <laughs> have the kindergarten questions on here. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just to finish Florida Red Tide, my role in that is to develop new technologies to alert the public of where the effects are. So I have a website, visitbeaches.org, uh, and smartphone apps um, to that I have trained beach sentinels reporting beach conditions twice daily. Uh, including red tide effects. And then I have another app called Seasick, C-S-I-C. I I just want to make Seasick or get it Seasick. But that allows anybody from anywhere to report effects uh, of all environmental hazards, but including Florida red tide. And then we also have uh, citizen science programs, including a NASA-funded cell phone microscope led by NOAA, GCUS, and MOAT, um, where we train citizens to take a sample of water, put it underneath a cell phone microscope, and an algorithm in an app automatically calculates the concentration by its shape, size, and movement. Mm. That information goes to a NOAA respiratory irritation model. Super cool. Dang. Yeah. So I do have a like kind of a question related to the red tide stuff. Because uh-huh. <laughs> I saw a clip uh, on Instagram where you were talking about red tide. It's the only thing relevant to the red tide, but uh, were you talking about red tide to Stephanie Abrams and Jim Cantori? Uh huh. All right. So, like, when you do stuff like that, do you get starstruck at all? Or are you like. <laughs> so, funny story. The first time that I was ever. You, this is on the Weather Channel. I know. Right? You're like. Yeah, and I'm the hugest fan of the Weather Channel. <laughs> okay. So, you're like. Hugest fan. Being remote satellite video right. in or something right and they're interviewing you right okay so the first time i'm like okay i'm doing an uh weather channel and, and i was always i was freaking out i was freaking out like crazy and then were you like right before you right before and then and then on you, like, Skype, nervous or you get anxiety yes, what happens i was shaking and the producer's like okay you'll be on with steph and jim in five i was like stephanie abrams and jim cantori i was like are you kidding me like and i know that the producer could probably still hear me and see me and I, my communications director was writing back at me I'm like oh my god what am I gonna do thank gosh when I do those uh, interviews I can't see them they can only see me okay because I would have I would have lost it uh, but Stephanie Abrams is a gator she is a yeah. gator yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I actually met her Which at an Atlanta awesome. Gator Club uh, meeting one time Did you? Yeah. that's yeah. awesome oh, damn, that's yeah. awesome I didn't know that it's oh, really cool. cool the secrets he keeps from me and, and now they're like I love them I'm you know that's cool yeah alright I was just curious. Yeah, it was it was a big deal. It's still a big deal every single time. Every single time, I'm I'm super excited for Weather Channel, and I'm doing a show on Weather Channel. Well, Are you? Yeah, it's not my show. I'm part of a show that okay. somebody else created. All right, cool. Someday. So what's that? What's that look like? I mean, it's something um, that's coming up in the works. Yeah, or what? Okay. yeah. So I'm filming for it in December. Awesome. Uh huh. That's cool. All right. So if you could be any animal, which one would you be and why? <laughs> That's a great question. So it's funny. I used to ask people that in interviews because that's what I was asked the first question. I said like an eagle. So then I could see how people are moving around and then go down and attack the best way possible. But no, now it's an octopus, man. Okay. Why? Because they, you don't expect it. You know, they're just all pretty and stuff. And then they're sneaky, you know? (laughs) They go under doors and escape things. I mean, they can't last for very long out of water. That might be problematic. But they are amazing. They, like, pick winners of the World Cup and stuff, too. Yeah. I mean, you remember that? Yeah, How do they super do that? Smart. <laughs> How do they do that? I don't know, man. They're just, you know, super intuitive. Smart. Intuitive, okay. Yeah. An octopus. Yeah. Writing that one down. What animal would you be calling? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, I've never thought about this question before. Wow. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. I've never thought about this. I'm going to ask you this, but Um, I've not given any thought. I mean, my instinct is like I'd be an alligator, of course, because I'm a gator. Sure. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Better hope that the right trapper finds you in someone's pond. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Michael, take over. Oh. Okay. Um, well, speaking of alligators and ponds, I, so was it your first, uh, the first Inspector uh, Planet episode was Lake Alice, is yeah. that right? Yeah, so yeah, I actually watched, watched that one today, and I thought that was interesting, and it's, it's not that dissimilar from the Red Tide conversation. So that's why I thought that I can solve Red Tide, because I can easily solve cyanobacteria by limiting nutrients. This is a completely different organism. So cyanobacteria, what we get in Lake Alice, what we get in freshwater bodies, um, there are over like 4,000 species of cyanobacteria, but it's a photosynthetic photosynthetic bacteria uh, where photoretide is a phytoplankton. 
microscope of phytoplankton. So they're they're motivated by different things. They act very different. Uh, for example, photoretide, they have two tails. They're called the dinoflagellate. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and cyanobacteria, they're kind of like they're, they don't move. I mean, they move with currents, but there's not much currents in a lake. And so for the Lake Owl specific one, um, it was, if I remember, because I, I was actually like running scooter business whenever I was watching this and I was like, I was just fascinated, I couldn't stop. But um, it, it seemed like one of the issues was it was um, caused by people who trying to treat the algae rather than what was causing um, the algae to be, prop, up, prop up in the first place. Yeah, and not to get too deep, that's kind of like what what my biggest like so box thing is is putting band-aids on problems mm-hmm. and not treating the problems at the source and that's kind of what was happening here you know we we built this lacrosse field we had all this nutrients coming into Italy Gallus. we had algae blooms they were treating the algae blooms with copper sulfate that was harmful to the fish and then deep well injecting that water when we got to a certain stage in the pond and it's great that we're, you know, recharging the groundwater table, but when you're using copper sulfate, if there was a, an algae bloom and if there was a harmful species like microcystis in there, that toxin would be injected into our drinking water source. So um, so my plan or my dissertation basically solved that problem by limiting the uh, amount of runoff coming to Lake Alice and keeping that stage low. Does, does it hurt more when it was like the University of Florida and it was a lacrosse field that was ca- causing this? Because you said you played lacrosse growing up. Like, does it hurt more when you feel like it's like, <laughs> you know, your own interests that are like betraying the environment? Or... I know. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I never really thought about it that way, but you are correct. You know what? I'm kind of mad at lacrosse, though. OK, so I transferred here because they told me that we were getting D1 lacrosse. I'm like, ah, you know, I'll just take a year off and then I'll play D1. Mm-hmm. That's a better fit. Um, because I'm awesome. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, but in fact, you know, they didn't get a team until 2009. So I called mm-hmm. the coach and I was like, I was like, okay, I want to walk on. She's like, okay, you get a private, you, you come and you can try out with me one-on-one. I was like, sweet. Okay. First of all, it had been a while. <laughs> Second of all, it turned out that I have no eligibility. You have to do all four years within six years. So, mm. so there you go. So you were, you were trying to walk on to uh, D1 at the University at of Florida as a grad student? Uh-huh. Okay. And I'm like, I'm going to be the oldest person in the NCAA. Right. Let's go. <laughs> yes. That's wild. So you have to do all four So you did four years of eligibility. So, you no. have to do it within six years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just trying to think. It seems like there's been cases where that didn't play out, but I... Like, there probably is. Yeah. I mean, I was I think gonna like, fight like it. Chris Winkie, who played for, quarterback for the Florida State like ages ago, he was an old guy playing quarterback. But oh yeah, but he never played in the first place. Okay, he came back. Like if I had never played at Hobart, that so then that's I what it was. Is yeah. your eligibility clock started ticking right. then? Okay, uh huh. That's a totally different uh, like. Yeah, I love that. You know what I mean? I, a tangent, I it, but yeah. uh, um, so. I mean, I have so many things. Like, it's, it's hard. It's hard to not get like <laughs> too sciencey. Well, yeah, don't too sciencey and don't too, too sciencey. I know. Yeah, you guys, no one will want to watch it. It's, it's, <laughs> what's, no, no one will want to watch it. <laughs> the, the thing worse than being too sciencey is too political. And you talk about your well, look at your shirt, bro. Oh yeah, I know. This, I love it. Box. This is why I'm straight hot. out of 2007 when I was I, 21. Yeah, I love that shirt. I Thank want you. one of those yeah. busted teeth, like busted literally. Tees. 12 years See, ago. Here's the thing. Climate oh, change so should not be political. It's science. It's been proven. But let's move yeah, on. Yeah. So <laughs> clean drinking water has obviously been an inspiration for you for a long time. Right. And the biggest problem we have domestically, the Flint water crisis, like mm. what? I mean, like I said, there, there, there are so many political components like tied to that. Mm-hmm. But what needs to be done there? Like, because we've been talking about this for a long time. That's a really good question. So it's it's funny. Back back when I started school here in 2001, uh, I had a class project, and it was focused on a school in Michigan that had lead in their drinking water, and that was actually my first rap. It was on granular activated carbon. It was called GAC. It was to a Wu Wu Tang beat. <laughs> Um, but but if you think about it, 2001, that was like how many years before it actually made mainstream media? This yeah, was a crazy. problem that should have been handled. I mean, there were old pipes. They needed to be switched out. That That is a budget 
allocation issue. And I don't know enough about their budget or their funding to really weigh in on that aspect. But I do know that, you know, it, that stuff needs to be <laughs> old, old lead pipes need to be replaced. I mean, it, you would think it would just be common sense or intuitive, but but it wasn't in that case. And they just had a problem in New Jersey as well. Mm. You know, this is this is something that that you wouldn't think would happen in the first world. But if you look worldwide, unsafe drinking water is the leading killer among children. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, clean drinking water should be a priority. So do you ever get involved in in the political side of the activism or do you just try to stay expert in science and this is what needs to happen? Or? I, I try to just stick with the science. And the reason for that is because people think you, you're biased mm. if you weigh in on your political opinions. And honestly, like the only political area that I even know about is environment, but I know a lot about environment, so I have strong opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, climate change, it shouldn't, it just shouldn't be political. I mean, what, what could be political is where to allocate funds. You know, they don't think it's important enough to allocate funds. They do fine. But to argue about the science is just crazy to me. Um, so, so instead of getting involved with the policy, I just basically say this, this, these are the data and these are the sources. And I encourage people to look at it, but they never do. Um, so eventually when I have time, I'm going to do an entire Instagram story to explain the science because I think it's, I think it's needed and I haven't seen anybody really do that. Um, so apparently I have to. I'll bless you for that because it definitely needs to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, cause that's definitely an avenue I'm interested in yeah. <laughs> as, uh, you know, what platforms have you used to help you kind of accomplish your mission, your goals? Because I mean, you you've, you're obviously really active uh, when it comes to using you know Instagram or other platforms. So I mean, what you know, where what what platforms are you using to help you accomplish this mission? Um, you know, TV obviously, and then okay. uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And the thing is like, I, I'm a research scientist. So, I mean, I'm busy all the time. So all of this stuff is extra, it's outside of work and it's time consuming. So I, have, I haven't been able to really focus on social media to try to you know, grow a following, a huge following or anything. I mean, I have decent enough that you know, they're supportive and stuff, but, right. but enough that I'm not being attacked. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> you don't want, you don't want on Facebook. It's a different story um, because of Red Tide was so controversial, mm. and people really wanted to blame one thing, and it there isn't one thing to blame. Um, so that was Facebook is tough. I like TV the best because no one can say anything back. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, no, but I really do use Instagram a lot. So um, every day I, I at least do some kind of story. Cool. I mean, so, I mean, it, it feels like, or at least from what I was able to consume through content and the things that you're doing that, that you travel fairly often, or I mean, at least you're getting out into different areas of the environment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's the, like, what's the coolest place that you've been to um, in your adventures as Inspector Planet? So most of my traveling is unfortunately for work. You know, I go to these places and mostly for, for talks, which is awesome. You know, I get to talk to kids around, around the US um, and a couple other countries. Um, but the coolest place is probably Hilo, Hawaii okay. for the Hawaii Science Museum. They, they sent me out there to do a talk um, about engineering and, and STEM. And it was during the volcano eruption so I got to take a boat out and see the volcano going into the water all the lava going into the water it was That's crazy cool. you put your hand down it was scolding hot like it was it was so interesting to me like all of the things that come into play and how this is growing the island um and then I threw up <laughs> what yeah I, the boat you know rocks uh. and <laughs> I was the only one that got seasick too, so it was super embarrassing. <laughs> and they were like filming me. It was, yeah, but it was really cool. 
up to that point. <laughs> they were filming me. Um, but the most amazing thing is that the people on the island, they were they were happy for Pele's return. Even even if their houses were completely destroyed, they're like, Pele is coming back to reclaim her land because that island was really formed from volcano. Yeah. It's super, I actually have a f- picture of me standing on the cold lava, like right where mm-hmm. it overflowed onto the street. So you see the street and then you see me like standing on the lava. That's You're stuff. kidding me, last year? Huh? No, not last year. It was a long time ago. I don't, when, when was that? I mean, it was the big island. Whenever the big right, island, yeah. you know, they kind of like went over the street, but there's, I'm literally standing on the hard rock lava that went over the street and there's the street in front of me. It's that is cool. awesome. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Is that the coolest place you've been? Um, I love Hawaii. I love Hawaii. And like when we went over there, it was because um, we had we had business friends that were actually over there. So they had a house on the big island and we stayed with them. It was really, really cool. That is so, awesome. What about that? you? Uh, coolest place I've been uh, would probably be when we went to Florence. Colin and I went to Florence uh, in February of 2018. Uh, it was actually for, if you know anything about Vespa scooters, we actually got to tour their facility, which is a little bit outside of, of Florence. But it was it was my first like abroad trip. Um, and I always knew that it was going to be the most memorable one would be the first one, but yeah. I was like eating all the Italian food. I was, like I was a kid in a candy store. There's so much history and like Renaissance history in Florence anyway. But. but that's like super extra special when you get get to see where your the product that you're selling is being manufactured. Right. Like you get to actually tour the factory and see them working on it. it that was a surreal moment for me too. Yeah. No, it's super cool. It's cool. That's pretty amazing. So I mean, out of all of these travels and all the things and all the hypotheses hypotheses that you're testing is it, did I say that right yeah. hypotheses okay. uh-huh. <laughs> was it, is it hypothesis that you're testing or hypotheses is if it's more, plural it's yeah plural. Okay. <laughs> that you're testing um, I mean what's like the craziest experiment or the craziest thing that has happened in your career it's what I'm doing right now I'm working with NASA to use aquaponics for wastewater treatment in space that's so wild. I know, right? <laughs> what? What is that? All right, so for the first grader in the room. Like, <laughs> so, okay, like so, break, so aquaponics is a system that uses living things in water, basically an aquarium, and it works together with a plant system. So basically water is pumped out, put through a plant system that uses the basically the fish poop as nutrients, and that gets filtered out in the media of the plant bed and then gets returned to the aquarium. And so basically what happens is after primary treatment for wastewater, uh, there's still a lot of nutrients and other things in the water that need to be cleaned out. These fish consume that nutrients and then their poop gets get filtered up to uh, plants. And then the plants can use that. Basically it's treating the water at the same time as it's allowing these animals to grow, uh, bivalve shellfish. Uh, mussels, clams, shrimp, um, and feeding a plant system that can provide lettuce, for example. So, I mean, the part that's the most fascinating to me about this is like, how do you get to work with NASA? Like, how did, <laughs> you know, like, how do those opportunities come? Are the, are, is NASA reaching out to you, or like, how are these collaborations well, and these types of things coming to fruition? Yeah. So most of the time, what happens is you apply. Uh, for a grant or you contact, you know, scientists in the government to collaborate on something. Um, but this time was different. This was an intern, a very ambitious intern, heard about, you know, what NASA was trying to do and reached out to the PI. And that PI contacted this intern's supervisor and the supervisor who was my director said, uh, that's way more Tracy's line because I'm an environmental engineer, water treatment. Yeah. Um, so that's, it. I mean, it just, that never happens that way, but it did for okay. this. And then uh, they came to Moat and then I went over to NASA and th- it is amazing. Like seriously, it was, talk about kid in the candy store. Like it was like that to see all the high level equipment that they have and it was all clean. No, I work in a nonprofit marine laboratory. <laughs> and so it was a big step to see NASA in all their facilities. It was pretty it was pretty incredible. It's awesome. Uh-huh. You know I always wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid. I believe it. 
Yeah. I mean, that was my backyard. Was I, yeah, yeah. I grew, both my parents worked for the Space Center. My best friend is actually, he just went to Houston and uh, toured, toured Johnson Space Center and saw the buoyancy lab and everything, so he was sending me pictures over this last week. But, but yeah, that was, as a kid, that was to, all I wanted to did do. Did you go to space camp? I went to space camp. My brother did. I never got yeah. to go. But that was always like the big award, like on the on the Universal shows or like the Nickelodeon shows or whatever. It was like, you had to go to space camp. <laughs> oh, really? It's true. Here's, here's a went, clarinet. I you went get to, to space, space camp. <laughs> I remember like my brother, sister, and I we always watched the space camp movie. Yeah. Dude, I, I love that, that movie. movie. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> did you watch that movie? See, you can nerd no, out. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe I missed out on that. I'm going to have to watch it. I'm pretty sure I have it on DVD. I'm actually impressed that it ever went to DVD, but I'm pretty sure. I own it. I it's love, awesome. I yeah. love that movie. I'm like reflecting back to my. <laughs> I might make this still happen one day. Maybe I'll go to space. I don't know. That, that's a natural <laughs> entrepreneur thing. Yeah, it's like, yeah, like, why, like why? You know, why stop? Like, we, I'm, we've been talking about you know happen. all the entrepreneurs have real estate. They have this. Like you know, you'll you'll know you've made it as an entrepreneur whenever you start going to space. You need to go to space. There you go. Yeah, that's yeah. the next thing. Yeah. Just makes sense. <laughs> it's a natural progression. Yeah. So the PI I'm working with, he's a chemist, and I, I love chemists because they know a whole bunch of stuff I don't. Um, but he wanted to be an astronaut, and the reason why he couldn't were, was his eyesight. Mm-hmm. Like you have to have perfect eyesight, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's too. So, yeah. Uh, so I was that's born not where... to be an astronaut. <laughs> so was I. Okay. So like seriously, I'm not I'm not pulling anybody's chain here. This is like what happened. I remember when I got super serious about being an astronaut. My dad was in the Air Force, and so he was, and he was a fighter pilot. So he was like, okay, well, like, if you're getting really serious about this, like, the, the step is to be a pilot, and then, you know, do the training, whatever, you start heading that direction, right? So he's like, he set me up with a um, Surgeon General to, like, do the testing, and I had to do, like, the depth perception, and I could not pass the colorblind test. You're kidding me. Could not pass it. There's like these little books that have like the little dots. Uh huh. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, with the, the numbers. With the numbers. Uh huh. And all you have to do is like re- flip them and read the numbers. And then, and I could do some of them, but there were certain like mixes of colors that I, you I'm see. like, uh, I don't see a number. Yep. And, and because of that, I would never be able to fly, like to be a pilot in the Air Force That's... or to be. Uh, an oh. astronaut, like because of that thing. So, but maybe I'll just go as a passenger one day. Or maybe I'll just team up with Elon Musk. And, there you go. Uh, <laughs> right. That's what. It, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, I need to get on that ISS. Yeah, you oh. know, and so it's it's interesting. I mean, even from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you know, you kind of like you reflect on those moments, and like, man, you know, do you persevere through that? Do you like still try to find like an exception and like still make this dream like come that is true? A great question. You know, right. like I mean, right. hey. Do you like try to figure it out? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, as I was saying earlier, I got really sick on that boat. You know, you're going into space. I'm going to be puking all over the place. (laughs) You know, but I think that that would be something I can train and get over. I don't know if you could get over the color blindness. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. It's like there might be a like it's a it's a rule that exists for a reason. But why why yeah. does it exist? That's what I'm wondering. Like, right. Why? It's probably more. It's not a, that you can't fly. It's that you're at risk of flying multi million dollar equipment that belongs to somebody else. Right. And they don't want that uh, risk. Right. But I'm you sure would, there's a very legitimate reason. I don't I don't necessarily right. know the reason. But. So color blindness is a dif- dysfunction in one of our. Yeah, I'm we defective. Like. Go ahead and say it, Tracy. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, you're defective. That was terrible. <laughs> So, okay, so the only reason why I know this is because my animal outtakes episode last week was on, you know, our dogs colorblind. So for the first time I had to learn about colorblindness um, and I said something completely wrong on the show and it got aired, but that's <laughs> besides the point. So, so what is this? What is this animal video? Outtakes. Animal outtakes video. Yeah. What is, what is it's this? A, it's a kid's show on ABC and okay. I uh, host a segment that myth busts animal myths. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Dog color blindness. Is yeah. one so how do like this? This is the stuff. I mean, I like I get it. The science stuff that you guys get all fascinated about. All right. <laughs> but like this is the stuff that fascinates me. It's like so. How do those opportunities come up? Like how are you getting like 
on ABC, like throughout throughout your course of the, your career, like what steps did you take to get featured on ABC to get the MythBusters? Because yeah. our audience doesn't even know this yet, but you were featured on MythBusters. Maybe we should start with this part first, yeah, so yeah, like yeah. people like are interested. Yeah, then, <laughs> so let's, let's do this. Let's talk about this stuff. This is though. podcasting at its best right here. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> so actually, that video that you saw, that in first Inspector Planet video, I did for my research. And I was going to have this chapter on uh, on outreach, and a committee member suggested that I leave it out, and I was pissed. But he was right. <laughs> he was right, and I'm glad that I did it um, because I didn't. I don't know a thing about social science, but anyway. So I made that video with a student that I randomly met at a football game. She was a freshman uh, at UF. First football game, she was all alone. I befriended her, and then it turned out that she was in the college of journalism and communications and then I realized that you know my 11 year old cousin looks up to Kim Kardashian she needs better role models I made this video contacted her to do it and she is still my videographer today Um, but that's (laughs) That's the video (laughs) yeah that's the video that Mythbusters found and that's how I got on Mythbusters and then uh, from Mythbusters I got um, you know a lot of press or whatever and then ABC that ABC show came to me and then um I started it just kind of went from there but even before Mythbusters Discovery contacted me about building a show around me um but what I didn't realize then because the third they came to me with two ideas and then Mythbusters worked um what I didn't realize is that 99.9 percent of these things don't work out I have worked with at least 50 producers on this you know whole show thing and very few of those things pan out you know I was even casted for uh, co-hosting a show um, with with a very famous uh, underwater photographer uh, in the Baltic Sea and it was going to be awesome and you know still it you know some these things don't pan out so if I would suggest anybody that wants to go into TV to never quit their day job Um, always always keep and, and be true to yourself, you know, do things that you're passionate about, whatever you want to do on TV, do it in real life, because if not, it's just not authentic. Um, and so getting environment to be mainstream media has really been like my thing. I don't care about being on TV. I don't want to be on TV, but if that's the best way to reach the next generation or more people so that we can all increase the scientific literacy, get on the same page and start, you know, moving forward, then that's what has to happen. There's so many lessons in that story. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking to myself, starting with the football game, <laughs> right? Like, I'm like, you you never know, I, you know, who you're sitting next to on an, right. air, on an airplane. Yep. Think about the people that you're sitting next to when you get on an airplane or like at a football game or mm-hmm. whatever, right? Like the fact that whatever happened there, you guys established in a, a, a relationship yep. in that football game that led to that person becoming your videographer, that led to this piece of content, that led to all of that (laughs) is awesome to me. I'm just like, I get fascinated by the seeds. Remember when I was talking to Darren Cook, I'm like, man, the seed, the seed that you planted that 25 years later became a $500 million plus organization, this huge organization, you know, like that fascinates me. You just never know. It's crazy, right? You just never know who you're sitting next to at a football game. I know. And it's, she even uh, quit her job came over to Moat, lived in a trailer, and worked for an entire summer with me and my 13 interns to make like a science reality show. That's so cool. And yeah. then that's the and that's the second piece, like the content. Like, right. Because I mean, we're content creators. Like I absolutely love to create podcasts, to create my vlog, to do videos for our clients. Like I'm like, dude, we need to create content. Content right. creates brand. And right. that's exactly what you were, you're able to show off your brand, show off your personal, your personal brand, who you are, the authenticity that comes with you that led to all of that opportunity. It's so cool. It, and the the coolest thing about it is that, oh, oh, is that you can actually put that time and energy into creating content and it, and it becomes something like it's tangible. With science, not so much. You can put a lifetime's work, worth of work into something that never, 
you never get to the end. You know, it, it, something happens and it turns out your hypothesis was wrong mm. or the experiment went wrong or, you know, you didn't get that proposal and you need to wait for the next year and the next time around. With science, it's really like you're never really winning, you know. I mean, you're not always losing, but it always feels like you are. So with creating content, it's kind of like it, it's kind of like you can accomplish something. You know, you you did something. And there's the proof. I I don't know. It's just a nice. Yeah, it's cool. a nice uh, part of my life that gives me some kind of accomplishment. Yeah. <laughs> you got a lot of cool content too. Oh, thanks. You know, we were checking out your YouTube channel and all the other things you got going on. And, oh, I mean, I, Instagram, everything. It's awesome. I, and the tough part about using, like, I just don't have time to like keep on. And I have so much content, and I just can't find the time to put it on YouTube. I know that sounds crazy, but I need like a secretary. Yeah, that's what companies like ours do. Yeah. <laughs> really? <So>, yeah. <laughs> we have a company called Repaint the Wall that is a content. It we we build brand through content creation. I was wondering what Repaint the Wall was. <laughs> that's exactly what we do. That's awesome. So, but yeah, I mean, because we've we've seen these pain points for people. It's like we we know that there's no better way to build brand than than exposing who you are as a person or right. as a business, like your values as a, as a company or a bit, you know, as a company or a person. And you know, if you can actually get the content out there to right. the world and actually create it and get it out there, like that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, but it's an ongoing process and it does take some work and yeah. time and it is an investment. So it is. And it. then, you know, my, my end game is to have inspector planet be this, you know, scientists for the public type thing where they use my app to tell me where environmental hazards are and then I take a mobile lab with my team and go there and investigate what's going on. Um, so, I mean, if, if I'm focused on that, I can't be focused on the other, like I'm, I'm gonna use you. I mean, <laughs> you know always, what I mean? We're always here. <laughs> Care, careful, he's defective. <laughs> yeah, you gotta watch out, I'm a little defective. Got this color blindness thing going on. Um, so, I mean, we gotta wrap up here in just a couple minutes, but um, there was something while I was just, you know, I'm just doing my little research. I'm like, all right, like I don't, I don't know Tracy, but when she comes in, I wanna make sure that I'm prepared and ready. And I came across this thing about a Marvel comic. Yeah. Like, what is that all about? So that was that was pretty exciting. After Mythbusters, um, m uh, the Marvel comic writer, Jeremy Whitley, w reached out to me and another girl in Mythbusters to be featured in The Unstoppable Wasp. And that was <laughs> pretty... so cool. That was pretty awesome. And then from there, um, a writer came to us to make our own comic. And so we have a comic called Secrets of Science, SOS. And it's really cool because it kind of, uh, it accomplishes everything I want to do in real life. You know, you find uh, an environmental problem or a scientific problem and you solve it with principles of science and everything goes great. And the cool thing about it is that there's hands-on experiments at the end. Uh, the citizen scientists featured in the comics, each issue, are real people, real citizen scientists. Um, and there's always a real expert featured at the end. So kids can actually see that there's, you know, a real person behind this expert. That's super cool. Yeah. So that's not out yet, but it is. It is. Oh, it is out. Yeah, so we have the first two issues out, and issue three is coming out in December. I have to reread it. Uh, okay. So probably New Year's, I would say, right now. Right now. Yeah, yeah. Get right SOS now. Issue we'll get three. It. That is so cool. And it, it reflects on the Citizen Science Project I did when I was in Hilo, Hawaii, uh, on Rapid Ohia death. Okay. So, yeah. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. and I have I have some bands for you guys. Yeah, if oh, you want. Sweet, heck yes, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, dude. I mean, this is cool. <laughs> I'm I'm geeking out a little bit, even over science. All right, well I'm gonna I'm gonna geek out one more time because okay, I did yeah, have something dude. that I wanted to talk about because it's uh, going back to when I was in undergrad um, taking organic chemistry classes. One of the one of the first times I felt like, hey, this is something I could I could do for a while was when I was learning about the super fun sites. And you talked about growing up outside of Buffalo, right, in Love Canal. And that was really what started the the super fun um, program did, in 1980. Yep. And a lot of people probably don't know this, but we have a site here in Gainesville. Yep. Um, it was uh, industrial waste, like the poor poor choices being made and, and how they dispose of industrial waste. And mm. that site has still not been cleaned up. It's still right. in remediation. Um, so, so it's interesting because I think that a lot of times people feel like 
things like Love Canal, things like Flint, things like whatever are it's they're disconnected. They're disconnected, right? But we have we have this thing in our own backyard, and I think the hardest part about um, that that education or like how do you how do you make this not happen is is people have that disconnect, but they also don't feel like their actions matter. So that seems like that's one of the biggest challenges is, is, is educating people. But how do you get on the individual level? I mean, we work in a scooter business where we have to we're tasked with responsible um, disposal of chemicals and stuff. Uh, otherwise, we we might have EPA come and audit our dealership and and so there's that threat but an individual doesn't necessarily have that threat and they don't right. necessarily see the ramification of their decisions so you're right so how do you bring up that awareness and and get people to feel like you know hey I'm not just preaching at you these things actually happen and they matter right um, enhancing environmental literacy is a huge obstacle um, but so personally, what I'm doing is expanding citizen science programs, allowing people to actually become scientists, putting that in classrooms, because, you know, you, you talk to adults and they're thinking about the next thing that they're saying. You talk to kids and they're actually taking it in, you know, and the, these kids, they're like they're like sponges and they will grow up to be the voters, to be the business owners, to be hairdressers, truck drivers, lawyers, doctors that will make decisions every day in every part of their life that affects the environment. So for me, that's that's what I really do. But but in general, humanity, you know, this whole evolution of humanity, I think kind of comes down to empathy. And the more we grow, the more we learn, the more intelligent we become, I think the more empathetic we'll become and be more conscious of the next generation of people across the world, the people in New York. But I think that the media has to get on board with this, you know, and it, and it can't just be a flash in the pan. You know, we, Puerto Rico, uh, you know, they're still dealing mm -hmm. with all of those effects and, and no one hears about it. So you think that it's just gone. The news cycle came and went. You're exactly right. And so I think that getting getting media to really follow this stuff to bring it to people's homes on a regular basis and follow those stories from cradle to grave um it would really make a huge difference for sure do you like I, I love the aspect of you know being that inspirational people where especially um young kids or, or even young girls can can see somebody um in a field that i i think is probably predominantly male dominated i know you're, you're um uh, at Moat, it's you said it was mostly females there. Yeah. It was founded by females, right? Which is awesome. Uh, do you do you ever get like? I mean, that's got to be. It's a different hat, right? To be that you know inspirational person that's that's getting people interested in STEM. But do you ever just be like, I wish I could just focus on this on on the science itself and not have to be about the fact that I'm a woman or that it's anything like you know. It's it's funny that you say that because it's it's not so much about the uh, male female thing for me at this point. Um, it was when I was a project engineer uh, working in land development, but now it's it's not so much that it's it's really the the time that I'm putting towards one thing or another and the perception of other scientists. So for other scientists and me, they look at me like, oh, she's just an outreach person. No, I just spend my personal time doing outreach on top of my work. Mm -hmm. You know, and I have people constantly every day telling me to stop doing that stuff, to focus, focus on one thing, focus on, um, but I, I heard, uh, this is gonna sound really dumb, but. <laughs> But when I heard J Lo's acceptance of a lifetime award, I think it was last year, and she she literally said the same thing that I had always said. You know, so many people told me to just stick with one thing, and I said no, I'm going to do it all, and she did. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm <laughs> not doing it as well as J Lo, but I'm trying. It's awesome. You're doing okay. Yeah, yeah it's awesome. It's fascinating to me. I mean, I uh, am just incredibly grateful that you made the like the time to come into our studio this Friday evening. So thank you so much for being Dude, here. Dude, I'd just be home doing work. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so, for getting I mean, me so out. You're, I mean, Moat is in Sarasota. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's your schedule like? Because you're in Gainesville. You're doing stuff at UF sometimes. I mean, what are you just kind of back and forth all the time? or? Uh, yeah, so I drive down 
to Sarasota on Tuesday mornings, drive back on Thursday evenings, work from home on Monday and Friday. Okay. Which, thank gosh, because I have employees and interns, and those are the days that, that I can actually get work done. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. It, the driving down and back isn't tough. Uh, the part that's hard is that my parents were in Sarasota, so it all made sense. And now that they're not going back and forth to my sister's house in St. Pete, that's the part that gets me. I'm not a good driver, <laughs> um, which we all found out very recently. <laughs> Um, what does that mean to me? Well, yeah. apparently <laughs> Teslas are really delicate. So I'm like, okay, I'm being a hypocrite. I just rapped about climate change and I'm driving this much. I, need, I Obviously, I need an electric car. So I got a Tesla. Okay. Let's just say like, I felt really good about it until I scraped it. I just scrape <laughs> in the shop for like six months. <laughs> I love it. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely love my Tesla. I can't uh, wait until did, they're. Did you see the new pickup truck they uh, live streamed no, yesterday? No, you no. Oh. You haven't seen it yet? No. They did a six oh, minute live stream of their new pickup truck yesterday. See, and people were super excited about it. And it looks ridiculous, if I say so myself. <laughs> really? Okay, yeah. so like, here's. You're going out on that limb, are you? Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And here's the thing with my test. I, the problem is it's so low. It's so low, and I'm so short. I think that if I had a Tesla pickup truck, pickup truck, it might be you better. Sh- you should see a picture. Maybe not safer for other people. You should people, see a picture but... before you say you want one. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, it is. It's this is this. wild looking. <laughs> okay. This is what happens. Uh, we're showing her a picture. Oh my <laughs> god. Yeah, there you go. Do you like that? It's like a reaction video. You want video. that, right? You want that? Come on. Tracy. That looks like 1982, but like the pixelated. It looks like it looks like uh, Minecraft. Pic- uh, right. right. <laughs> That's a good distri- description. Pixelated. Yeah. No, it's, it's a that is a good description. I like that. Flavor. Looks like something straight out of Minecraft. So, I mean, we have to wrap up. But where can where can our audience find you? Connect with you? Where are you at on social media? All that kind of stuff. At Inspector Planet. Everywhere. Everywhere. Facebook. Everywhere. Instagram. I keep it really consistent. Twitter. Do you Inspector TikTok? Planet. Do you TikTok yet? So I put. I put part of my music video on TikTok. <laughs> we should, you and I should make a TikTok should before a you collaboration, leave. Yeah. We'll do it today. We do a collaboration. Okay. We, we need more for today's quota. I've, I've <laughs> you know, that's all I've ever done on TikTok. This will be new. <laughs> this will be new. <laughs> this will we, be new. We got new. this, you and me. I like it. All right, cool. All right. You guys, everybody find her at Inspector Planet on virtually every social media platform. Um, thank you so much for all of your incredible hard work and thank you keeping for our planet me. safe and, and educating everyone. It's been amazing having you here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to, we're going to do a little side hustle, an extra piece of content where I'm actually gonna dive into kind of like your goals and New Year's resolutions. So that'll be coming up. Um, but before we sign off, I just want to wish everybody a very happy new year. Yeah, absolutely. So, happy new year to everybody. Uh, this is the last episode of season two, and we will be starting season three. I am incredibly honored that we get to start season three did, with episode 87. Did you ever think we'd get into season three? <laughs> I, I mean, who knew? Who knew? It's all <laughs> uncharted territory. We, who knew? I mean, but this is really awesome. I mean, we're going to... This podcast is as old as it's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It <laughs> that's is. A, that's a good point. Uh, so episode 87 going into season three. So, I mean, I'm really excited and just... It's awesome to see everything that's been happening with this podcast. So I just want to say thank you guys so much for supporting us. You are awesome. We love you. And happy new year from your podcast family. (laughs) We will see you later. Bye. Oh, wait, I got to sign off. This is the WHOA GNV podcast. The podcast bringing you businesses and individuals that make you go, whoa. Whoa. Tracy, give us your best whoa. Whoa. Nice. (laughs) Awesome. We will see See you you later. That was great. See ya. Bye.